You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcast on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for May 21st, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where our local Republican Party, holy crap, really gave the game away this week. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Dive right in, Drift Class. Hey, Blue Gal. How you do? Anything going on in your town today? Anything going on this week? Anything? Is it today or is it, was, it tomorrow? It was yesterday. It was oh yesterday. Oh, my God. And, and, the, and the tape is up at uh, Facebook, and it's being moderated by people who say, I will delete any negative comments about this, so please don't even bother. What happened is there's the Lincoln dinner yes. for the re- local county Republican Party here in Springfield, Illinois. The 117th annual Lincoln Day Dinner held three miles away from where Abraham Lincoln is, in fact, buried. So there's no more Lincoln place, really, in the country than Sangamon County. Everything here is Lincoln. Everything Lincoln here. Yeah. Uh If it's not Adelaide Stevenson, it's Lincoln. But, uh, yeah, and this is a fundraiser. Let's be clear. The reason that they hold this dinner is to charge people $150 for one share Mm-hmm. and more, it's like all other political fundraisers. Yeah. If you want to meet and greet, if you want to do X, Y, and Z, of having a table and your name in the program and your organization in the program, then you have to pay more. Mm-hmm. So they want to get a person in there to speak who is going to put $150 butts in the seats, right? right? And so, of course, you know, they have the only people that the... Sangamon County Republican Party knows, guaranteed, will get butts in the seats, are Fox News personalities. That's all. That's all that's, they know. That's the whole world. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to get Donald Trump. No. So, forget it. No, he's in a um, different, he's in a different uh, you could get him for enough money, I guess, but oh, you, yeah. you're not going to get him because they don't have that kind of money to right. hire his and, and they, But they do want to, they definitely want to fill the, the auditorium and they want $150 a piece. So, it's going to be... Mm-hmm. Few years ago, it was Janine Pirro. Well, let's uh, let's 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 save that for a second. All right, because because the reveal is so fascinating <laughs> to me. Um, because of the justification, first of all, let's just jump to it. The person they hired to come and tell the wingnuts in um, the year of our Lord twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one is Candace Goddamn Owens. Candace um, Owens, that shit conspiracy Pez dispenser, anti vax freak, um, Hitler sympathizer. Candace, COVID-19 denier. Yeah, Candace goddamn Owens. They hired her. And you knew it was not going to go well. I mean, it's going to go well because they filled, I'm sure they filled it up. And I'm sure there, there are more than enough assholes in this town who will pay a shitload of money to hear her lie to them. Um, but the headline in our local paper, and there were two columns, two different articles on the front page about this yesterday or the day before. On, on page one. On page one. Above of our the fold. local paper. Covering the headline read, Owens coming to Springfield. Yes. And the headline read, Sangamon County GOP leaders defend speaker. <laughs> Not <laughs> Sangamon County GOP leaders welcome speaker, are excited to have this speaker. <laughs> they went immediately into the crouch that, well, you know, this is a fundraiser. And, you know, the, the kids seem to like her and she, she brings people in. But that's the part about the reveal is the part I found most pathetic and most indicative of the fact that the Republican Party is actually rotten all the way down to the grassroots. These are people who who live and work in this town. These are local Republican elected officials raising money for mostly down ticket stuff. You know, circuit clerks and, you know, state um, representatives to the to the state house, things like that. And the, and of all the people in the universe they could invite to speak to them and guarantee a sold out house of people who would not just pay money, but would pay the additional money for pictures and additional money for mm-hmm. sponsorship and additional. And of course, there's always the hallway fundraiser where, you know, you get the guy or the woman out in the hall that, you know, has a big checkbook and you say, by the way, you know, we could really use another couple of grand for thus and so, which happens at, you know, every fundraiser. But it was Candace Owens and the reason the rationalization they put in the newspaper was, well, you know, we're a big tent party. 
Uh, we, we want all voices to be representative. There were two things that really, really jumped out <laughs> was the fact that the party chairman would not discuss whether or not there were any objections because that's an internal matter. Yeah. And secondly, every year they have an honoree here. Mm-hmm. And the honoree this year is the, is the former chairman, the past chairwoman of this group who died February 2nd of complications from COVID-19. Right. So they invited a COVID-19 denier to dance on her grave mm-hmm. to raise money for the party that she helped create, mm-hmm. which is just grotesquely perfect in the way the Republicans think, the, the, the lizard brain of the Republican Party. But they went to, they, they said over and over again you know, that I'm quoting now, GOP leaders say that their big tent is large enough to include controversial commentator. And, you know, she's a young, energetic African-American woman who has lots of energy, double the word energy, and appeals to young people. And that it's a big tent party. And you know what? It's a big tent party. And some people were troubled by it, but they're not going to quit the party. I'm sure, you know, I disagree with lots of people. Yeah, but there's a difference between disagreeing with someone over, I don't know, marginal tax rates and Hitler denial. Mm-hmm. That's a very mm-hmm. big thing. The defensive crouch was, you know, we are a very open party. We want to hear from all kinds of voices. So let's take a look at that theory, shall we? Um, last year, it was Jason Chaffetz, who's a, currently a Fox News troll uh, and has taken up permanent residence in Donald Trump's underwear drawer. The year before that, it was, oh, it was Oliver North, noted perjurist and unindicted Iran-Contra traitor, who went on and on about the assault from the left and the Disarm America movement is the best funded, most sophisticated assault on American liberties in our history. Blah, 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 blah. You know, everyone should have a bazooka because the liberals are commies. The year before that, it was Janine Pirro. Mm -hmm. The year before that, it was Corey Lewandowski. Are we noticing a pattern yet? This is their big tent. It's a ho- it's nothing but year after year after year of Fox News assholes coming to lie to these mopes and meatheads and racists about what the scary liberals are up to. Mm-hmm. Now, the year mm-hmm. before that, it was Laura Ingram. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> How could I forget good old Laura Ingram? And the year before that, it was Corey Lewandowski again. There's a real lack of interest in issues and more a headliner of name recognition and will own the libs, have a 30-minute yeah. speech over dinner of owning the libs. That's it. Well, yeah. tw- going back all the way to 2012, the guest was Ted Nugent, who who made who, who arrived in town telling local reporters that Barack Obama was an America-hating punk and mm-hmm. has a long history of, you know, threatening the life of Barack Obama and threatening the life of Hillary Clinton and, and just being an absolute dreg scumbag. Uh, but he was introduced in the newspaper as a rock and roll guy, a hunter, mm-hmm. and a gun enthusiast. Yeah, gun enthusiast and, yeah. uh, and outdoorsman. Out, don't forget outdoorsman. Yeah. So, so <laughs> they know what they're doing, and they yeah. know what their people want to hear, and they're willing to spend a little money to raise a lot of money by giving them someone like Candace Owens to, to stand right. up on, Even on though stage. She's, she's Hitler she's, made Germany great again. She's insane. She's yeah. fucking yeah. And you go over to the local Facebook page. Oh, God, I love her so much. Oh, my God. She sticks it to the lips. She really does. Oh, my. Mm-hmm. And, and I can hear these people in the pews of my church. Yeah. I can hear these people at the supermarket. And that's why Rodney Davis wins here, despite the fact that Rodney Davis should not be a congressman from yeah. anywhere. And that's why Darren LaHood is probably going to win back the house, his house Ugh. seat. Because these are this is the, this is Trump country. Yes, mm-hmm. we have a big blue city, and our state is is largely blue when you look at it from the sky, and it's it trends purple in some places. But down here in central Illinois, it's fucking Kentucky. Mm-hmm. You know, as mm-hmm. as a friend of mine told me when I used to come down to Springfield on business and didn't quite understand what was going on, it was no, you got to understand Springfield is a, is a is a largest southern town. Yeah, it is not a northern Illinois community. It is a it is a deeply sympathetic to the Confederate cause. Um, Berg with, and I think also, that's going a little far, but well, yeah, it's it might be, or maybe it was true Lincoln, back then. Because Lincoln, well, there's and the I, problem. You know yeah. that that's the problem. But the Lincoln people keep inviting Confederate flag waving exactly. lunatics. Well, that's that's the only people they can invite because right. they they need name recognition, and all they've got is their media. I think that you know, a hundred years from now, a historian's going to look at the creation of Fox News as 
the demise, the beginning of the oh, demise yeah. Yeah. of the Republican Party because they they created a fart chamber where that's all they listened to and their voters loved it and were loyal to them. Mm -hmm. But eventually generations came along who knew what Fox <laughs> is about. Right. It right. reminds me, though, I, I don't want to sleep on how the newspaper covered this. Right. Because they couldn't just... First of all, they wanted to cover it as a news story. Yes. And so they couldn't put an ad for the Candace Owen event in the front of the paper. They had to cover it as a news story. And therefore, they had to cover the controversial nature of who they were having come And, and mind you, our local paper, which is a notoriously right-leaning rag, mm -hmm. um, and is now like four pages long, and has had headlines, headlines on the front page of lost dog found dead on roof right you know right, right that's that's you know it's a small town newspaper the the coverage of this reminded me of that time that mark kirk ran against tammy duckworth yeah and uh it was right before the election of 2016 and uh mark kirk and tammy duckworth running for the senate mm -hmm. were in a debate like the week before the election and uh tammy duckworth said talked about her military history and her being in the military and a military family and mm -hmm. how important it was. And she said, you know, I'm a daughter of the American Revolution. Now, many, many of you know, Tammy Duckworth is our senator mm -hmm. and uh, she'll be running for re-election in 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and she lost a leg in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, and she's also the only senator, I believe, who had a baby while in office. I so, think you might be right. Uh, at this debate, Tammy Duckworth said, and I'm a daughter of the American Revolution. And Mark Kirk, the Republican candidate for, you know, incumbent senator, mm -hmm. said to her, I forgot your parents came all the way from Thailand to serve George Washington. Oh, He said yeah. that during the debate. Like, yeah. a microphone was in front of him when he said that. Now, now let, let's, let's be clear. <laughs> let's be clear. Yeah. Um. A decade later, or six years later, that would have gotten him the Republican nomination. For nomination, right right, right, right. I'm sorry, Tammy Duckworth lost both legs yes. in Iraq. Okay, yes. I forgot about that. Um, it, the fact of the matter is, Tammy Duckworth's father is a Marine Corps veteran whose family roots trace back to before the American Revolution, and they did serve. Rut row. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the point, but the point being that on the Saturday before Election Day. The State Journal Register had a headline in the paper, above the fold, number one headline that said, Kirk says he's, quote, not a racist. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what you want to see yeah. in the newspaper three days before an election. <laughs> yeah, you've just spent, I don't know how many millions of dollars on your campaign. Yeah. And, and your final statement to the public to the is, public hey, is not a racist. <laughs> this guy, not a racist. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what did you just say? Much what that, it reminded me so much of what, how the State Journal Register was trying to parse Candace Owens. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, she's a dynamic African-American youngster. Well, that was, those are the, <laughs> those were the quotes being offered by the people who were the Republican Party spokespeople. Who had hired her to come to Springfield. Yes. Well, right. yeah, that's, right. that's, no, it's, it's absolutely the case. And because, you know, I was on the um, uh, Citizens Advisory Board of the newspaper mm -hmm. for a while and was just always gobsmacked by how cowardly um, the editorial staff was when it came to talking about the fact that they have a hard right slant all the time mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. their paying customers are octogenarian Republicans who want to read all about how liberals are communists. Right. And the right. company that bought them and runs the newspaper is entirely sympathetic to that message. And the person right in the middle of that was the you know managing editor. Yeah. Who and they, want, to, they want to read. The audience wants to read Ann Coulter three days right. a week. That's what they want to do. And when your humble scrivener asked, why do you syndicate a horrible Gorgon, mm -hmm. a lying, racist, bile-spewing uh, witch like Ann Coulter, um, the managing who is, editor- who has, who has zero journalistic integrity. Right. I mean, she is plagiarized and lied about sources yeah. and- made up sources in her books and oh and by not a she's not a good writer she's not a good researcher and here are and, the titles of all the books yeah. she's written about yeah. liberals are traitors and liberals are liars and liberals are, why do you right. syndicate there 
And you could just, the managing editor, you know, in my mind, looked down at the floor, looked at the ceiling and said, well, you know, uh, for balance. <laughs> like, who are you balancing her against that is as bad as her on the left? Because I can't think of anyone. Mm-hmm. And it was like, well, you know, we, we published Leonard Pitts. Uh-huh. And, I'm like, and that's like the and other side. Both and it was, sides. And it was, yeah. I really don't want to answer this question. Because the answer is, my boss makes me do this. And I don't have the balls to quit because right. I'm a news person and this is the only job I got. So right. I'm going to stand right. here and do the best I can. But honestly, our subscribers are right-wing meatheads who want mm-hmm. to read this shit and we're mm-hmm. going to give it to them or this paper is going to go out of business. Mm-hmm. And you mm-hmm. know, that is the ugly truth that you will never read in, you know, a newspaper, mm-hmm. which is why newspapers are in trouble because they can't talk about the really, really important things that are right in front of them because the octogenarian lunatics who pay their bills don't want to hear it. So that's why as you drive through Springfield, you can hear on at least a couple of radio stations all the right-wing talkers you want. Right. Drift class, uh, just changing gears for a minute. Um, I'm always interested in when uh, a political story pops out of the political press and gets attention elsewhere. <laughs> and and one place I noticed it, and people will probably think, well, that's not exactly apolitical because Jimmy Kimmel has been very political about health care. And uh, his monologues are often poking fun at Trump and and COVID, his COVID response and so forth. Uh, but he's a he's a stand up comedian. Yeah. And this week, Jimmy Kimmel ran fifty two, fifty three seconds of um, Tim Ryan's uh, calling out Republicans from the House floor and saying, holy cow, you guys, you know, there, we need two political parties that are grounded in reality and you ain't it. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Jimmy Kimmel ran that entire viral moment, took time out of his monologue to run that entire thing. So his audience would hear it was, uh, important and on my attention scale. Oh, wow. You know, he, here he, here he's showing you the whole thing to make sure you saw it. Mm Mm-hmm. And we saw this also in Scientific American Magazine. Yeah, <laughs> that was week. wild. Yeah. <laughs> uh, trying to figure out why some Republicans mistrust science. And their Scientific American's uh, research showed that the reason Republicans mistrust science is that their leaders tell them to. Really? Yeah. That's, like that's a shock. I'm Laura shocked. Laura Ingram over there. constantly mm-hmm. saying, don't trust the experts. And of course, she just has some rando do her hair on the street, right? She doesn't choose an expert to do her makeup or lighting or hair or uh, teleprompter or camera or direction or childcare or no, car, no. car, car or dentistry or. <laughs> it's all very spontaneous. It's all just <laughs> her. She just but picks a bunch of randos off the street and yeah. doesn't trust experts on any of that, right? So. Uh, well, how long yeah. has this been going on? Just a couple of weeks or maybe a no. month or two or. <laughs> They've been denigrating the government and particularly government scientists for decades. Mm -hmm. And I I would imagine this goes back to cigarettes, if I were to guess. Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So that's that's fascinating. And just just to see where some of this pops out, I think it's important to watch for that. If you notice non-political or apolitical or places that you don't expect to talk politics to have these kind of stories, be sure to send them into us. We'd love to see them. Yeah. And this is not because we would like politics to go everywhere. Right. Exactly the opposite is true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What scientists are saying and doing should be fairly non-controversial. Right. You know, it should be that they're off doing stuff and they test it and you know, occasionally they make mistakes and occasionally they screw up and it's bad. But overall, There should be big areas of society that just run because they're being run by competent people that, you know, we, we choose or because the people we chose appoint them or they're trusted because of certification or whatever, whatever. And that's just not true anymore because there are the reason all this shit gets gets politicized is because these groups, scientists, especially tell Republicans things they don't want to believe Mm -hmm. and they have built up enough, um, terrifying momentum in their own media universe that they just don't have to listen to it anymore. They just blow it away. So they find there's an entire subgroup that is, is devoted to um, gutting science and, and attacking science and challenging science. or just asking the question. Um, and there's a lot of money in that. The, the, the reason, reason Ben Dominic exists at all is because he was funded by 
um, the Heartland Institute in in Illinois, up in Chicago, which was a, a, a pro-tobacco um, libertarian organization that attacked tobacco science until it became impossible to do so, and then pivoted over to pro-petroleum, uh, big oil, because that that's where the money was, and now it's all about freedom, but it's always the same stupid argument, and it's always... There's shit going on in the world that we're doing that's damaging, and I don't want to believe it. I don't want to believe guns are a problem. So I will not fund government health care studies into the effects of guns on society because I don't want to see the results. And this really does trail all the way over into something like the um, um, January 6th commission that may or may not exist. It's a matter of we do not want to see the results of the any investigation into what the hell happened to the Capitol on January 6th. So we're just not going to permit it. Well, and and this is later in our notes, but since you brought it up, um, Jamie Gorelick, who served on the 9-11 Commission, said it was exceedingly unusual for potential witnesses to be the ones deciding whether there should be a yeah. commission. Yeah. These guys are complicit with what mm-hmm. happened. Well, and I, I think Brother Charlie Pierce had an article today about um, that he has no faith that politics can fix this problem. This is mm-hmm. beyond politics is not up to this. Right. This needs to be in the courts. The mm-hmm. courts mm-hmm. need to be putting people in jail all the way up to Donald Trump, frankly, yeah. um, for their um, complicity in lying to their voters yeah. and whipping them into a frenzy and pulling them at the Capitol and pulling the trigger yeah. and then standing back and acting like, what? We don't know what happened. Well, and we're we are so early on in the prosecution stage of this yes. whole thing. Who's going to flip on whom? How? What we're going to find out in terms of? I mean, this congressman was on CNN yesterday talking about. Well, when I was in my hotel room, people were talking about doing something at two. Right. So, and I was like, everybody, everybody's like, wow, what hotel room were you in? Whose hotel were you staying at? And uh, who are the people that were talking in your hotel room about doing something? Because now you're a witness. And this was by way of him explaining why Donald Trump is not responsible. Donald for Trump's it. not responsible because they were planning all along to do something, do something in at my hotel o'clock. in my hotel room. Like, yeah, you can yeah. hear brakes squealing all over the sort of mental all over the world. Like, <laughs> what? What did you just confess to on national right. television? Right. And, but that's the thing about these stories that I, I, they, they don't raise my ire as much as they should. Simply because nothing's going to happen to that guy, nothing's going to happen to him. And they have they have rigged their the system well enough that they are pretty confident that they they're going to get away with it. They don't ever have to be held. They'll never be held accountable for anything. Yes, what color are these people? They're all white, honey. And what gender are they? Mostly? They're all men, honey, except yeah. for Candace Owens, who right. and that's why they hire her <laughs> to front her out there and say, "Oh no, all the racists are the black people." Black people, the real, and then liberals are the real racist. And you get a bunch of, you know, pasty white octogenarians go, yes, yes. This is porn for them. Yeah. Jeff Glass, talk to me about the soft coup that happened during the waning days of the Trump administration. Yeah, this was, uh, this was the soft coup that, well, our listeners are being very, very smart people. They probably heard about it, but we had a military coup in this country a few months ago. And it's not the fun West Wing kind of coup. Where senior staff, you know, noble senior staff step in for a few hours to help the noble ailing president keep his secret. Uh, this is an actual military coup where the leaders of America's armed forces uh, conspired to ignore the lawful orders of the president of the United States. Now, the lawful orders were also insane and destructive. They were like Hitler giving the order to burn Paris right. on the way out mm-hmm. because the order was withdraw American troops from everywhere. Pull mm-hmm. everyone out of everywhere, which would have, you know, fucked up everything. And it, and it, it, it is, it's an insane idea. I am all for withdrawing American troops for where they don't belong. But when you've lost an election and you're planning to stage a coup. And he's a lame duck. He's, he's a lame, lame duck. Exactly. And now he's making major military motions. Yeah. All over the world <laughs> to, to fuck up the yeah. Biden administration. Right. This is why. On purpose. They, yeah. This is why they didn't cooperate with a transition team. This is why right. they lied up until the last minute. They were dragged out of office. This is why they're still lying. It's because. And, this, and everybody in the, the military orbit of yeah. Donald Trump was an acting person. Right. Not confirmed by the Senate. So. There was just no legitimacy to mm-hmm. these orders. No. Well, there, and, I mean, there was. This and is, if, he was, if he was a sane president, he wouldn't yeah. have made them. Well, that, no, that, <laughs> yeah. and I've, I heard someone discuss the difference between a legal order and an, and an ethical order. 
Uh, you know, th- this is a legal order. The president mm-hmm. of the United States can move troops around. They do it all the time. Send mm-hmm. them in, pull them out. You know, the War Powers Act, which is, you know, let's face it, it's a condom with a million holes in it. But presidents do this all the time. Donald Trump was within his rights to say, I want troops out of Afghanistan now. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, the, the <laughs> upper echelons of the military being a bureaucracy would, well, you know, here's the thing. We, should, we need to study this. And there's logistics. There's all kinds of ways to slow walk this shit. Mm-hmm. But bottom line is the president of the United States gets to do stuff like that because right. we have given that office the power to do shit like that. Well, and it's it's rather important if you need to put uh, National Guard troops on the ground, if yeah. you need to do, you know, if there's a weather disaster – and you need to call out the military to handle it for the sake of keeping the river open or keeping some, you know, saving people's lives. Yeah. The president has to be able to do that. Right. Yeah, the, the only place that they withdrew military protection of was the, was the nation's capital, you know, yeah. during yeah. the riots. That's, that's the where riot. they decided to get skimpy mm-hmm. and get, get cheap on defending that particular patch of ground. And so, and when the president of the United States gives a lawful but incredibly asshole-ish and destructive order and the command structure structure says nah we're not going to follow that mm-hmm. that's a coup right <laughs> that's a, right. that is the uh, textbook definition of a coup and i happen to be thrilled that they did that because we had a deranged leader who should have been impeached a couple of times and wasn't impeached and wasn't removed because the republican party are traitors all the way down to the grassroots and they then and th- this was all cool with them but the fact that we had to have the military violate the chain of command um, and do it, you know, with sleight of hand, no one stood well, up. And, and there were all kinds of things going on in the White House for the entire four years where they mm-hmm. we and they would just assume that Donald Trump would forget in four days what he said four days ago. And right. they just wouldn't do what he said. And, and there was so, and because Donald Trump is who he is. There was no Kirk Douglas um, moment, you know, right, in seven right. days in May. When he's asked, you know, do you know who Judas was? Yes, he's a man I served under and respected for years. There was no dramatic, you know, personal right. confrontation. It was just a bunch of generals going, yeah, we'll get right on that. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. We'll mm-hmm. see what we need to do. Oh, you know, here's a shiny thing over here we need to look at. And Trump yeah. wandered away. But that does not negate the fact we had a military coup in this country. Yeah. And the we fact need that- you to dis- I-, I wonder about Space Force in that respect. Yeah. Well, Mr. President, we need you to help design the uniforms for Space Force. Yes. Oh, okay. I'll okay. Do that. I'll get out right on. We need the colors of the new Air Force One. We need you to do that. Oh, okay. You know, mm-hmm. and and that was a big deal to him. Uh, I want to talk for a minute about Al Franken. He yeah. did a video this week about Liz Cheney. He's good at that. He's really He's good, good at that. that. He's good at remembering stuff. I wonder where he gets that from. It's all his wife, his wife, <laughs> Franny. <laughs> Franny, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, he remembered exactly who Liz Cheney is. Yeah. And what she's done. And that she voted, not only voted for Trump, but voted with Trump over 80% of the time. She voted with Trump mm-hmm. more than Mark Meadows did. Yeah. And Mark Meadows wound up being Trump's chief of staff. Yeah. Yep. So she was a bigger supporter of Trump's policies than Mark Meadows. and But she didn't count on him being quite this nuts. Right. And uh, after the election, when there's going to be a transition of power, et cetera, the lying, the corruption, the race ba- baiting, it's all too much for me now. Oh, no. <laughs> no. He went too far. Mm-hmm. So I was grateful to see that, and I suggest you check out that YouTube. It's well worth watching. Yeah, he's a, he's, he's, he's a good explainer of things. He is. He really is. As, as you know, I do listen to our friends on the, on the right. I listen to them, our, our so-called allies. I listen to what they say when they're not on MSNBC, because, you know, and, and it's kind because of because it's a, different because it's different. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's different, but it also here's the thing. You remember, you remember the Bush years. Uh-huh. You know, oh my God, this is going to happen. Oh my God, this is going to happen. Oh, this is happening. Oh, this is terrible. Oh shit. Oh, they're going to cover it up. Please don't cover it up. Oh, they've covered it up and we're moving on. Uh-huh. It was it uh-huh. was watching through a thick pane of glass. The Republican Party absolutely skull fuck this country. Uh-huh. Pardon my uh-huh. language and get away with it. Mm-hmm. And and all the people who enabled George Bush and enabled Dick Cheney and let this happen, all being given jobs in the media where they could control the message. And and the feeling of watching this happen just below the radar of the mainstream media. The the people who were doing this shit were pretty clear about what they were doing. 
But nobody in the anchor chair was getting very upset about it. And that's what troubles me is I'm watching our anti-Trump allies um, regrouping now that they all have media jobs so they can control the, the narrative from MSNBC and CNN and, and big, big podcasts to get promotion on MSNBC and CNN and so forth. Um, going back to the both sides do it thing. Mm-hmm, right. Go, right. Uh, uh, listen to David Jolly this week, completely rewrite the uh, history of Obamacare um, to make it a partisan uh, food fight where neither side would give an inch. Yeah. And if only a third way organization like David Jolly's scam were available to broker a deal. <laughs> And between the two sides, maybe we could have gotten some... He really doesn't understand the uh, battle over Obamacare. Oh, he does. He's just lying about it. He, I, I'm oh, convinced. Really? Because he, he, he kept pining about if only we could, you know, in, in child care, mm-hmm. for example. Child care, uh, he and Charlie Sykes were going back and forth about why can't the, this, we bridge this gap and, you know, we're not going to get a center-right party, but we need something out there that breaks. And he started using words I started, I remembered, like... The duopoly is the problem. Oh, God. And the way to break the duopoly is with political disruption. (laughs) And my organization is like a disruptor organization. It's going to break this duopoly and move on to get really important things going. Like, and Charlie Sykes says, yeah, like childcare. You know, Romney and, uh, and Biden are really close on this. And I think if, if we were lived in a different environment that wasn't so hyper partisan, they could do a deal. And I sat there going, thank you, Charlie Sykes, for accidentally proving that David Jolly is talking out of his ass Uh because yes, Joe Biden would agree with that as the president of the United States and leader of the democratic party and an alternate universe where Mitt Romney wasn't a pariah in his party. Right. And wasn't completely spoke for no one and led Mm -hmm. no one. Yeah, they could do a deal, but he is a pariah in his party. I'm really interested in how Marco Rubio is going to vote on the child care tax credit because he bounced that idea. He did. On John Stewart's show. Yes, he did. Like, we shouldn't be giving poor people money once a year. We should be giving it to them every month. And he was treating it as a zero increase in public spending. Okay, mm-hmm. that's the, that, that is the difference. But, you know, Biden is increasing it and making sure that right. people get every a month. generous amount. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, Marco Rubio's idea was don't do child care tax credit at at tax time, give them a check every month. And that was his, he was pushing that mm-hmm. um, as, well, you know, a young center right Republican. Mm-hmm. And so if he's going to vote against the child care tax credit, which I expect him to do so. Yeah. Uh, he did before he did in the emergency. He didn't vote for the emergency, um, the rescue plan, excuse no. me. No. So uh, it's just going to be interesting to see. I don't think, I think you're right. I think uh, Romney, and Biden are not that far apart. They're not. But Romney is a is an outcast, right? Precisely because In his the caucus. problem the yeah. problem is not the duopoly. The no, problem is the Republican Party. Correct. And David Jolly would rather pull his own arms off and admit that he he is he is defaulting very explicitly to. And mind you, this this organization of his is ninety three percent funded by a former tobacco executive. Right. It has something like 649 members in New York, the only place it's on the ballot. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't want to call it a party because parties are bad because David Jolly doesn't understand, you know, how politics works, where <laughs> you get people together in a group to do a thing. And if your group is bigger and more focused, they will get more done and beat the other group that doesn't want the shit done. That's what parties are supposed to be. But he's, and I use this analogy when I wrote this up, he's, he's um, Ricky Roma in Glen Gary, Glen Ross. You know, he's, he's talking about, you know, big ideas, you know, like the future and your life and what you leave behind and, and principles and transparency and democracy. And you know what? I've got this lovely plot of land over here that will solve all your problem. And a bunch of dumb, credulous, wealthy suburban dupes are going to go, yup, that sounds great. I, I Sign me up for that. I, th- I think we should break up that duopoly. But you dig one inch below the surface, especially on the Affordable Care Act. Mm-hmm. You know, the mm-hmm. whole thing about, well, the Affordable Care Act, you know, there was Democrats only wanted this group you know, protected and Republicans only wanted that group protected and there was nobody in the middle. And, you know, and if this Romney-Biden coalition were just possible, like, fuck you. The, the starting point that Obama had for negotiations was Romney care. 
Correct. You idiot. You asshole. <laughs> you fucking asshole. And Romney was so terrified of his own party that he pretended Romney care never happened. His he one accomplishment, about, his huge accomplishment. Yeah, he lied as about it. Governor of Massachusetts. It was in his book. It was in his book, yeah. and he lied about it being in his book. And it, and it worked. In Massachusetts, it yeah. worked. But, and they like it. But the Republican Party, not the duopoly, the Republican Party was so dedicated to sabotaging Barack Obama, no matter yeah. what he did, which again, David Jolly didn't, wasn't born on Tuesday. Yeah. You know, he, the Republican Party had an explicit policy of sabotaging Barack Obama. Barack Obama was the, is the perfect David Jolly president. He represented everything David Jolly wants. And his party spent eight except years. Except he was black. Except he was black. And he was a Democrat. And they spent eight years in a racist primal scream to destroy him. And that led to Donald Trump being elected, which led to David Jolly leaving the party and then becoming an independent and becoming this scam Ola thing. And, and now he's on MSNBC all the time talking about his new group and the way he pitches and it. And isn't is, Charlie Sykes signing on to that oh as yeah, well? Oh, yeah. He thinks yeah. it's great. It's just so great. It's so great. But it's, it's all, all it is is the same bullshit Beltway media stuff about the duopoly and, and both sides do it. And isn't it terrible all the hyperpartisanship from 2016? And I think, frankly, Matthew Dow should sue him. <laughs> he's stealing Matthew Dowd's whole act from 2016. Yeah, well, I need to ask you about Lori Lightfoot. Okay. Because Lori Lightfoot, I don't know exactly what's going on with this. And no. I, part of it is the right wing is, you know, knee jerk and just reacts horribly to anything that's going on. Right. Lori Lightfoot is about to celebrate her second anniversary as mayor of Chicago. Mm -hmm. She's not a popular mayor among white people at all. No. And uh, she's got a tough job. And she's had a tough job during a pandemic and, she and had, during snowstorms. And no, it's a thankless job. And she has made mistakes. And she has made mistakes. Yes, she has. So on the anniversary of her inauguration, the second anniversary of her inauguration, she has decided to uh, have only reporters who are people of color interview her for the day. For the day. One damn day. You mean they're not banned for life from City no. Hall? No. 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 Okay. Now, can uh, since I worked for the city for uh, mm -hmm. a number of years, I know that every department has its own um, public information officer. Yeah. She hasn't cut them off from the media at all. No, they're still allowed to talk to anybody. Oh, yeah. so there's an entire marketing department inside of City Hall that does nothing but mayor stuff and each department yeah, has she, its own thing. They, nobody is oh. excluded from talking to any of them anytime they what want. What about older people? Are, are older people not allowed to talk to black people anymore? I would like the mayor to try to tell an alderman who they can talk to yeah, and who well. they can't talk to. That yeah. would be hilarious. That would be hilarious. I think that'd be. <laughs> so, so for one day, um, she would like to um, take questions from people of color about her she would unique like to position. Elevate reporters in the city of Chicago who are mm -hmm. people of color. Right. By uh, celebrating her one day anniversary of her ina inauguration. Uh huh. By allowing just those people to interview her. Now, yes. you know, if this was the Biden administration, they would simply announce a series of interviews right. and name the people that were, they, that were going to be interviewing the president that day. And, oh, look, they're all people of color. Congrats. Isn't that wonderful that mm -hmm. Biden chose people of color to interview right. him that day, right? Well, everyone she, but she Chastity, with, everyone but Chastity Rion would, right, uh, no. whatever her name is. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, Chandelier Rion, whatever her yeah. name is, right? Yeah. From ONN. Um, ONN is not mm -hmm. allowed. She went full North Korea this week with yeah. her interview with Trump. She's, but she's stuck on that. She but yeah. is. Anyway, I interrupted. Um, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Uh, Lori Lightfoot led with the "I'm I'm going to do only people of color this day." Yeah, and. Of course, the right wing is flipping out that she's reverse racist and right. it's reverse racism. And it's it's absurd that for one day she's going to conduct interviews with people of color and now she's well, reverse racist. I was know. wondering why Tulsi Gabbard was trending on Twitter. That's why. <laughs> yeah. So Tulsi, what isn't she one of the one of the losers on America's Got uh, political talent, like she no, lost in the first round. She didn't get she didn't even make it into the oh, finals of oh. that. No, she's but, uh, but she says crazy things, and she's willing to yeah, pounce on Yeah, she's willing to say reverse racism about reverse the mayor racism. of Chicago. So, you know, she's, well, I, I assume the local Republican Party is going to book her for next year for speaking yeah. at the... <laughs> She'll probably be on the dais for... Now, well, and Lori Lightfoot, you know, here's the thing. Well, first of all, I'm going to repeat. 
Yeah. Being mayor of a big city, whether it's New York or Chicago or Los Angeles, wherever it is, yes, is a fucking thankless job. It is. You will never make everybody happy, and you will never. You know, you have to love your city and be willing to take a lot of shit from a lot of people to have yeah. that job. I wouldn't want to be mayor of a city. No, no. Well, and the people who've successfully mayored Chicago. Mm-hmm. for the most part, have been named daily. And they're white and male and Catholic and Irish and... And machine. And, and, they, and, and a machine. Daddy Daly yeah. had a fucking machine. And yeah. it worked fine as a as an absolute one-party totalitarian state. It was very yeah. efficiently run. Yeah. And it ran that way for t- 25, 26 years yeah, until he... corrupt as fuck, and yeah. that's what it was. It was. Yes. And, and there's lovely books on the subject. You know, I recommend, highly recommend Boss by Mike Royko. Uh, if only to go through the names in there of uh, politicians and notice how many of their kids are now politicians and now politicians. Yeah. It's remarkable. Um, but if you want to know about what a black mayor in Chicago's life Mm -hmm. was like, Mm -hmm. you need to study Harold Washington. Harold Washington was a black mayor, got elected to the city of Chicago. The, the alderman promptly lost their mind. Yeah. And the, the, the the undivided alderman, the uh, city council, which gave daily anything he wanted suddenly, discovered how much they loved Republicans yeah, and shut that place down immediately and wouldn't let him govern. Um, and what was the slogan? Oh, and, and his opponent was a guy yeah. named Bernie Epton and Bernie Epton's slogan was before it's too late. Mm-hmm. You know, the good old days mm-hmm. of real open racism where, mm-hmm. you know, this scary black man is going to come and take money away from you and give it to other scary black people. You don't want that to happen. Do you? Oh God, no. And the bungalow belt went mad and, you know, but that's, not that far below the surface. Right. And Lori right. Lightfoot is also a woman and mm-hmm. is also gay. Mm-hmm. And it's, there's a whole bunch of things going on there. And she wants to, to raise up people of color for one day out of the year. And I don't see anything wrong with that. Other than the fact that no matter what anybody on the left does, it's going right. to be turned into a right wing talking point on Fox. Cause if they don't have it, they'll make it up. They'll make it up. Mm-hmm. And and the number one, I wrote about this today, the number one, of course, instance of that was Gateway Pundit, stupidest man on the internet, <laughs> decided to make up a lie about how Joe Biden really didn't drive that F-150 truck. It was a Secret Service agent next to him with a safety steering wheel. Mm-hmm. And they had a blurred screenshot of the truck <laughs> <laughs> proving, look at that. Look. Can can you see the second steering wheel in there? Look. You sort of can. Can you see it? Can you sort of see it? Oh crap! My yeah. uh, and and the person that had to come out and debunk that was Ford Motor Company. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, uh, so they they and and we're going to see more of that. I mean, oh, yeah. they really are. It is interesting to watch Fox News scrambling to find the brainwashing word that's going to work. Woke didn't work. Hunter Biden's laptop didn't work. And to watch, if you watch the first, and I don't recommend it, but if you watch the first 30 seconds of Hannity uh-huh. every night, like don't, we did several times don't, this don't week. Do it. Don't do it. Let us do it for you. But we did. We did. We, I, yeah. You know, the first 30 seconds of Hannity, he's doing Hunter Biden, Burisma, China. Yeah. Emails. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we're, we're, no, 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 no. Yeah. We're back to Reverend Wright, Barack yeah. Obama. Right, and, and, right. It, and well, look, when a, Bill Ayers. Those, those quotes from those quotes from the book, the reporter's book about how quite understandably Barack Obama thinks Donald Trump is a whole lot of swear words. Yeah, brought out the whole Reverend gave gave Hannity an opportunity to remind everyone Obama and Reverend Wright hating America. Hating yeah. America. And let's run quotes of him wagging his finger, talking about goddamn America. And yeah. because they, you play the oldies. When you yeah. don't have anything new, yeah. you play the oldies. And the people who watch that shit and think it's news, they don't know the difference. They're, they've mm-hmm. been dead from the neck up for 20 years. They have no, as long as you keep that stuff pumping into their veins, whatever form it comes in, toxic or not, doesn't, true or not, they don't care. They just need that stuff every day to keep them upright and angry. And, right. you know, that's what they're there for. Um, yep. Although I got to say, um, our anti Trump allied podcasts break down like this. I'll put it very simply. Um, 50% of most of these podcasts, these are our allies are in fact, Oh my God, the GOP's lost his mind. Look how their look how their base can be whipped into a frenzy over some trivial or imaginary or out of context thing that some liberal may or may not have done somewhere. 
And I agree with all that. But the back half of those podcasts are almost always, oh my God, look at this trivial, imaginary, wildly out of context thing some liberal may or may not have said somewhere. To save democracy, Democrats must immediately choke out their own activist base, that's you and me, and instead do all the shit that we anti-Trump conservatives want them to do. Mm -hmm. They use the same propaganda that, that they decry Fox putting out there and then turn around and say, well, this is why, you know, Democrats have to haul in the progressive wing of their party and just do what we tell them to do. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. fuck you. You can't have it both ways, which again is why I, 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 I'm not invited onto the Bulwark podcast yet again. (laughs) No, you're not. No. All right. I want to talk for a minute about the great resignation. Yeah. Uh, we usually don't quote LinkedIn news. Right. But uh, they have had some interesting stories about jobs and recruitment and workplace issues. Yeah. Um, I've also noticed uh, one in the conversation where it was, you know, is kind of an outlet for academic popular articles um, talking about uh, sort of the BS of corporate culture trying to get people to come back to the office. Yes. And people are not willing to come back no. to the office because <clears throat> they've moved or they're meeting all of their deadlines at home and they don't want to commute. Um, And you had this uh, thing from LinkedIn news, the pandemic and the policy choices that followed have upended the economy, both at home and abroad, causing everything from microchip shortages to inflationary pressures. An interview in Bloomberg predicts that it will also result in a great resignation. Mm -hmm. Countless employees leaving their jobs, either for greener pastures or a lifestyle change. Below, human resources workers, recruiters, and other LinkedIn members are weighing in on the potential for this tidal wave, and they do. Um, There was a strike uh, at the Washingtonian Magazine, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's uh, wealthy Washington, D.C. residents getting their parties photographed and uh, hotel ads, high-end hotel ads. That's what the Washingtonian Magazine is. You'll find that in your hotel. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. and the uh, editor-in-chief of the Washingtonian magazine um, decided to open his pie hole, the CEO of this magazine, and he was suggesting that the workers could lose benefits like health care if they can insist on continuing to work from home. Mm-hmm. Um, the staff just took a one-day strike. Yeah. And okay. said, you're, you're, uh, we're not going to publish today. We're not going to submit stories today because we've met our publication deadlines every single month during this pandemic. Right. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, you do not appreciate us. (laughs) You know, you are, this is bullshit. Um, And the CEO had to apologize. But you've got a year in which millions of employees have been forced to work from home and have made it work. Yeah. And you goddamn better well appreciate it because they've learned that you, they do not need to go through the commute time They do not need to go through the bullshit of their boss looking over their shoulder every five minutes. No. And they can get their work done on their own time in their own way and manage themselves. And if they can't, then fire them. Yes. Right. You know, there are some people who do goof off all day from home, but they do that. (laughs) You can catch plenty of employees in the office playing solitaire or looking at porn. Uh, Yeah. See, that's the thing. That's the thing. It's Uh, like, fire those people. (laughs) If they aren't meeting their deadlines and getting the work done. And I was, I was up early this morning. Uh, mm-hmm. watching some man bun on probably CNN um, extolling the virtues of coming back to the office because, you know, the great creativity in the office takes place at human Bullshit. interaction. <laughs> no, and, and he's describing an office I've never worked in. Right, right. Um, you know, right. Where, where people are basically, you know, rollerblading between, you know, workstations and interacting and having great spontaneous creative moments. And, you know, there are companies like that and that's yeah. great. And people right. who work there are happy. And I'm sure they're happy to go back to work. But, the other side of that is there's a whole bunch of workplaces that are not like that. And that are toxic. That are, yes. well, that, and that are piecework. You do yeah. X, Y, and yeah. Z uh, you know, in this time frame, and then you move on to the next thing, and that's that. And they're toxic mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. shitty and awful. And there was a... And back, particularly for women. Yes. Oh, God, you know, yeah. Who have to wear heels and a mini skirt and put makeup on and look nice and yep. be slightly sexy, but not too sexy. Don't want that. And... If she if he pats your bottom, just just laugh it off. Well, and, you know, mm, you know, mm, cry mm. in the bathroom if you have to. But well, HR is your friend. No, HR, HR is not your friend. friend. No, they're not no, your friend. No, they're right. not your friend. You'll get fired. Well, and, for complaining and, to HR. And yeah. layer layer on top of that, the fact there was a whole bunch of literature, and I'm real familiar with this because it was had to do with manufacturing, which was my thing, about 
people in their 50s and 60s getting ready to retire. Mm-hmm. That the mm-hmm. problem with manufacturing was that there's no uh, there's no succession planning right. because all these people who are who are in their last years of productivity in their companies or working on the factory floor are getting ready to leave and there's nobody to replace them because we mm-hmm. haven't been training people for the last 20 years to replace them. Because that, everybody wants their kid to work in a bank, right. not in a factory, right. So there right. was this demographic bubble that was coming anyway that was postponed by the Great Recession. Because people were like, oh, shit, I better hang on to whatever job I have because I lose my house if I don't. And I might even lose my house if I do. So there, that was warped by, um, by ex- exigent factors that are no longer true. So that demographic bubble is still there. Plus, you have after a pandemic, just like you said, people experience what it's like to work at home. And you know what? It's not that bad. And it saves you money. And it saves you time. You get to be with your kids. And and, and Maybe you can hybrid. Maybe you can go to the office some of the time. But Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, it ain't that bad working at home. And honestly, um, there is a job that recently opened up in Springfield that I would be perfect for. Um, And I read the job description, and I am not interested in any way. Here's why. It looks like it's the work of five people. It looks like an impossibly difficult job. The people who you – the constituents, multiple constituents you'd be answerable to – don't get along with each other and all think whoever's in that job is terrible, doing a terrible job, no matter what you do. So it's a no win situation. And I'm like, am I, would I willingly go back into an environment that is abusive, that's exhausting, that is 120 hours a week, even though it says 40 for a little bit of money and a title? And the answer is, oh my God, no. <laughs> oh no, mm-hmm. no, no, no. There, I'm, there might be a job out there that's perfect for me. And that wouldn't be an environment like that. And that I would definitely consider. But this is such a, it was such a clear example of 10 years ago, I would have been fighting for this thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and I'm not interested mm-hmm. in, in, in going through that agony um, of being well, underpaid. I, I think, I don't think you're alone at all in that. No, I think no. that's what we're seeing in exactly. this change of environment. Everybody in this country, in this world, just about died last year. Yep. Everyone faced their own mortality of what happens if I get this thing yep. and I die. Mm-hmm. And that changes your perspective a lot. It does. Or and it what, makes, if, what it happens makes you to my focus children? on what's important. Right. What's ha- it makes you focus on what's important. And what is important is not working 60-hour weeks. Exactly. exactly. For no money. Exactly. And, and that's true from the fast food worker all the way up to the mid-level manager. You mm-hmm. know, of if, you're, if you own the company, you're making millions of dollars and you want to, you know, another boat. And that's why you're doing your stock buyback. You know, I don't have any sympathy for you. But... Everyone who's ma- who's getting by, trying to trying to pay their mortgage mm-hmm. and and save for college and save for retirement at the same time, and might have a parent living with them. They're not going to go to work at a job where oh, you know, and we might need you to stay over on a Saturday yeah. and do X, Y, and Z, and you're going to need to be you know tethered to your cell phone at all times so that if mm-hmm. I text you, you can get back to me at in five seconds. And that is that kind of. Um, you are not valuable as a person kind of uh, corporate environment is just as real in nonprofits as it is in corporations. I can, I can attest to that yep. personal experience. That yep. is absolutely true. And it is. And then it's that on the layer of guilt of yeah. we're doing this for a cause, Yes, you know, and no, <laughs> I can't kill myself for you. Sorry. No, no. sorry. And I won't. And it, yeah. it is a different, I can tell you this. It is a different mindset when, I gave up the idea that I wanted to lead anything that Mm -hmm. in which I was not also had the authority to do what I felt needed to be done. Right. All of the, it's like riding. I always say this, it's like riding in the backseat of a bicycle built for two. You always have to pedal and you never get to steer. Yeah. No. And those kind of jobs just eat away at your soul. Yeah, they do. And if the person steering is fine and we get along fine and I, it's. And we'll take your suggestion and it's the right way to do it. Yeah. (laughs) I'm happy to do it. But I have been in, I've worked way too many jobs um, where it doesn't matter public sector, private sector, education sector, Mm -hmm. same dynamic. And I can see clearly why if given an alternative, um, people would not want to go back into that building and work on that job if that was not actually a requirement for doing the job. If you're not, right, if you're not right. walking around the floor, if you're not a security guard, if you're not interacting with people as you know part of your job, mm-hmm. um, then there's no reason in the world why you should have to go back into that well, environment. Well, this is why corporations need to really talk to their, and, and employers need to talk to their employees and yes. find out if they have met 
the needs of the job from what they're doing at home, if they've been able to do it, mm-hmm. if they've been able to do the job from home, then flexibility is going to be the key word if you want to yeah. hold on to that person. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I, all I can say is... And better pay. <laughs> yeah. When I was a boss, I was an awesome boss. And I was an awesome boss because I learned from all the shitty bosses what not to do and what people really need and what they appreciate and how to take five minutes to listen to someone and Mm -hmm. how to handle people who just shouldn't be there and need to go um, and do it with dispatch and dispassion. But anyway, we need to move on. To the Bidening and a news roundup. After you, my dear. Turns out the FBI gathered 18 electronic devices from Rudy Giuliani's home and office. Oh God. They got, they got his switch. They got his, uh, his Wii, <laughs> his Wii that he practiced, that his son practices golf on so he can be, you know, <laughs> run for governor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was my favorite joke of the week was from Jimmy Kimmel who mm-hmm. said that it's a good thing Andrew Giuliani is a professional golfer. That way, when he gets the lowest amount of votes, <laughs> he'll think he won. Yeah. <laughs> He's just a piece of work, isn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like father, like son, I suppose. Uh-huh. Well, uh, just FYI, the White House uh, it has brought back climate scientists forced out by the Trump administration. Michael Kupperberg has returned as the executive director of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. The Bidening continues. The Biden administration is working with OKCupid okay to get young people to take the vaccine, and online dating sites are putting I'm vaccinated badges on their websites and offering what they call incentives <laughs> for people to get vaccinated. And you showed me a video today of Andy Slavitt. Poor Andy Slavitt. He wasn't this. really needing to do this. He well, he read it through out loud, but you could tell. From a script uh, that he was he clearly trying to. He read from a script to... about OK Cupid and Bumble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think Andy Slavitt's ever been on Bumble. <laughs> I, I think half of those were made up by SNL writers who were, you know, working from home. I don't, and, I don't uh, think so. They were all real. No, no, no. There's a... It, Getting people to matched up is an eternally open and lucrative market. Yes. Um, and doing it well is also a valuable, you know, public it service. Is. It is. It um, is. Yeah. But over his shoulder, you pointed out to me, now watch Fauci. Watch Anthony Fauci. <laughs> watch Fauci. And, <laughs> yeah. And you compared it. I thought I that was interesting. Oh, that's okay. It was his Fauci face. Fauci and face. <laughs> it was the exact opposite, but very similar in terms of the way his face muscles moved. To the Fauci face when he's working for Trump. And Trump is saying, you know, put a light bulb up your ass and shoot bleach into your arm. Mm -hmm, And he's mm -hmm. trying so hard not to go, oh, fuck. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. This guy really is insane. And you can just see it's it's him trying very hard to keep a straight face. But for exactly the opposite reason. This time he's cracking up because. He's cracking up because he knows Andy Slavitt. And he he knows how he's like, oh, I, my entire career in immunology Uh was so that people can hook up on bundle, bumble. Yeah, that's which is which is perfect, and yet you know in his heart of hearts, it's like this is a, this is such a cool idea because like, it gets there's the people. Fifty million people on these right. websites, and they're young, and they're people who need to get vaccinated. Yeah, and getting laid is a really good motivator. It is for young people. It is. <laughs> it turns out, if only the advertising industry would figure this out. Well, this is why people call themselves independents because <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to. They don't want to they be don't. seen as uh, undateable. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm a rebel. I'm trouble. Uh-huh. I'm an independent. No, didn't you vote for Republicans like your entire? No, no, no. I'm uh-huh. an independent. Independent Believe constitutional it or conservative. Not, yeah. The guy at the Trump rally who had a blowhorn and yeah. said, "I'm an independent." Believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Okay. So there. Um, <laughs> the U.S. will send at least 20 million doses of the Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson and Johnson coronavirus vaccine abroad by the end of June. The 20 million doses are in addition to Biden's previous commitment to send 60 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine to other countries once the vaccine is cleared for use by the Food and Drug Administration. Approximately 39 million American families will start receiving monthly tax, child tax credit payments starting July 15th. Drift class, this reminds me of you and the drinking age. Uh-huh. Because this, is go- this goes up to the age of 18. I know. I know. And our youngest child is 17 and a half. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Your class was was uh, had was 19, just turned nineteen. Just turned nineteen, um, <laughs> and when, the drinking age went up to twenty one. <laughs> uh, two months later, they went up to twenty one. Like, God damn! Now, did that stop me? Did that stop no. anybody I knew? Did any 
person of my age cohort ever have any problem getting a hold of alcohol or pot no. when we wanted it? Of no. course not. But it was such a, I felt it so personally. Like you yeah. really had to, yeah. you picked me. Okay. Now I'm yeah. going to hate you for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, so, so the payments, which are part of the expanded child tax credit program in the American Rescue Plan provides up to $300 a month for each child under six. And that's like the diaper tax. That's yeah. what that is. You yep. know, the, the pull-up tax. Um, and up to $250 a month for each child, six through the end of your 17th year, in right. other, you know, your 18th birthday. Mm-hmm. The Biden administration estimates that more than 65 million children or 88% of all U.S. kids nationwide will receive the benefit. That's amazing. That's mm-hmm. amazing to me. That it is really, going to lift half the children in this country out of poverty. That Absolutely. is the yeah. that is the social policy equivalent of driving up to the Grand Canyon and not realizing how big it is until you mm-hmm. stand in front mm-hmm. of the Grand Canyon and go, "Holy cow! This is just this is what can change the world." It will, and this yeah. is what progressive government can and should do. Um, I'm on, terrified about the midterm strip glass. I, I am too, and I will take my victories where I find them. Yeah, and this is an unalloyed victory. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, Mitch McConnell, ever heard of him, announced he will kill any infrastructure bill that includes any tax increases. Uh, here's a quote from him directly. President Biden's plans to tax to raise taxes would hit Americans at all income levels. That's a lie. Lie. And slow the economy down to a crawl. That's a lie. It won't earn a single Republican vote. That's probably true. We're going to fight it the whole way. I'm sure you will. And this is exactly the same stance that the... Um, Entire Republican Party took when Bill Clinton was told by them that they that he had to clean up their deficit when he mm-hmm. was elected. And he mm-hmm. said, okay, we're going to have to do some stuff and maybe cut government here and raise taxes. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. You don't get to raise taxes. That's absolutely forbidden. And it required um, reconciliation and a tie-breaking vote by Al Gore mm-hmm. to get mm-hmm. done what he wanted done because Republicans have always been this fucking awful and and negotiating in completely bad faith all the time speaking of negotiating (laughs) bad faith house gop leaders kevin mccoward yeah (laughs) yeah that's what that's our new name for him and steve scalise whipped gop members to vote against the creation of a bipartisan national commission to investigate the january 6th attack they had previously indicated it would be a vote of conscience but the, and uh oh, we changed our mind. Uh-huh. Leadership recommends a no vote. Scalise's office said in a notice sent to House GOP members. This, despite giving his blessing to Representative John Katko to negotiate with Democrats on his behalf to craft a compromise deal, and despite Katko getting everything McCarthy wanted mm-hmm. at the last minute, they said no. Everybody should vote no on it. Oh, everybody vote no, no, fast. And, and 30- our our Congressman Rodney Davis voted yes. Yes. For the commission. He was one of the 35 whose name went on a scroll on Laura Ingram's show of the rhino traders. 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 And of course, um, uh, Darren LaHood voted against it. Yeah. Because that's welcome to Republican Illinois politics. Well, and and a lot of people think that Rodney voting that way is an indication not that he's an independent center Republican and so forth. What it indicates is. He's not running for re-election. He's running for governor. Yeah. Well, and we don't know that yet. No. But, but uh, it's interesting to me that that's the interpretation that people are coming away with is right. not, oh, look how independent he is of Kevin McCarthy. He'll vote on his own terms and not mm-hmm. just with the party line all the, oh, wait, he's running for governor. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, oh I get it. <laughs> now, despite all this, the House voted to create an independent commission to investigate the uh, January 16th assault. The bill to create a bipartisan 10-person commission tasked with delivering a report uh, now um, was passed 252 to 175 with 35 Republicans voting to support the measure. However, Mitch McConnell on February 12th said Donald Trump is morally responsible for the January 6th attack. This week, Mitch McConnell formally announced that he opposes the January 6th commission. There are things right under the surface, facts that we all saw on television, that we all know to be true that mm-hmm. they will not allow to come to light if they can do anything about and it. And they especially don't want it to come to light who funded a lot of these buses, because we all know it was Ginny Thomas's group. Well, and, yeah. and this might as well be, you know, in, a, in a weird way, Watergate all over again, except mm-hmm. we know what the tapes say. We yeah. know what they're doing. They committed a crime. They they have attempted to, to, to overthrow American democracy. 
And now they're trying to cover it up. And they're trying to cover it up in plain sight. And, he and di- everybody knows what, like you said, what the tapes, everyone knows who Donald Trump was. Yeah. This and is it's not, not this tragedy where some Republicans cried over Nixon saying right. I, he was my president and I thought he was a great guy. And then he broke the law and now I have to vote against him. I heard, I heard the tape and he said bribery and money. And now I'm crying and crying and oh, I got to vote against him. No, 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 no. They know who he was. The yeah. reason that they're terrified of crossing him is they, that he is the base and the base yeah. is him. Um, this week, we also found out that the Trump Justice Department used a secret grand jury subpoena in an attempt to identify the person behind a Twitter account dedicated to mocking Representative Devin Nunez. And I should say, right off the bat, it's me. I confess. No, I you are it. not Devin Nunez's no, cow. No, I'm not. I'm Devin <laughs> Nunez's cat. Yeah, I was so close. I was so close. But, you know, oh, God. No. But that shows you how, how petty and how corrupt they are at the same yeah. time. Yeah. The, New York State AG investigation into the Trump Organization is no longer purely civil. They are now <laughs> actively investigating the Trump Organization in a criminal capacity, along with the Manhattan DA. And the fact that we didn't lead with that should yeah. tell you something. It's it's just rolling along. Yeah, it's it's and rolling along in all kinds of directions, and it's all coming the same way. Yeah. Uh, and just this is again one of those stories. Oh, and by the way. Oh, and by the way, the FBI is investigating what it describes as a massive scheme to illegally finance Senator Susan Collins' 2020 re-election bid. And oh, they covered the their tracks really carefully to make sure that the concerned senator didn't know anything about it. Yes. yes. She's now very concerned. Don't get me started about Win Red right now. We don't have time for that. But, no, no. That was know, a few again, episodes that's one ago. one of my hobby horses yeah. is Win Red being for profit instead of Act Blue being nonprofit and Win Red being for profit. Okay. Israel and Hamas agreed to a tentative ceasefire after 11 days of fighting in the Gaza. Saying fighting is not no. the right word. No. Um, we're grateful for the ceasefire. We are. And I I don't want to get into a long conversation about this, but Bibi Netanyahu is corrupt as fuck and needs to go. Yeah. If you want to hear the other side of this discussion, uh, <laughs> the first half of Mona Charon's unabashed oh, support of Bibi Netanyahu and oh, Democrats' God. Size with Terrorists podcast is up right uh-huh. now. So. Go over and enjoy yourself, but you won't find that here. Instead, yeah. we're going to talk about how the House barely approved a $1.9 billion spending bill to fortify security at the place where they work, the Capitol, after the uh, January 6th insurrection. The legislation was approved in a 213 to 212 vote after a group of Democratic progressives objected to spending the millions more on the Capitol police without more knowledge about mm-hmm. whether some officers were complicit in the January 6th riot, which I think is a perfectly valid thing to Having bring up. Having some control over the money or just throwing it at them. That's what they wanted. Yeah. They wanted some control over how this was going to un- unfold. Yeah. And what they were going to get for it. You yeah. know, that, we need increased security at the Capitol. I don't think anyone's going to doubt that. But we would really like to know what the hell the police were up to mm-hmm. during this time. And we're going to withhold our vote until and on giving you money until we get some answers. Yeah. Well, and the funding bill now goes to the Senate where Mitch McConnell will kill it while Joe Manchin wrings his hands and does absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Approximately 444,000 Americans filed first-time unemployment claims last week, a pandemic-era low. This figure, however, is still well above pre-pandemic mm-hmm. levels. We've got work to do. Yes, we do. Lawyers have located the parents of 54 migrant children separated from their families by the Trump administration. The Biden administration task force, however, estimates that roughly 1,000 families remain separated. Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed into law legislation that prohibits abortion once a fetal heartbeat is detected, effectively banning most abortions in the state before many women know they are pregnant Mm -hmm. at the same time they executed a death row inmate. Same day. Without uh, media coverage, I believe. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't allow the press in. Oh, yeah, they didn't allow reporters in. Oh, we forgot. Maybe they only allowed Fox News in. You know, that's what they do now when they mm-hmm. want to do something horrible. They let the let the freaks in. Uh, this this one is proves out your theory, I mm-hmm. think, that this whole farce was staged so that the federal government would do something. Mm-hmm. And when the federal government div- didn't, they hung themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Republican-dominated Maricopa County Board of Supervisors has finally had enough and has called on the Republican-led state Senate in Arizona – to end the recount of the 2020 election, saying that the audit is a sham and a con. And hey. by the way, the, the news that broke this morning is that um, the state of Arizona is going to have to buy all new voting machines from the <laughs> ones that were, you know, handled 
uh-huh. by the Cyber Ninjas group because those are now corrupted. They're all and porn cyber. Now, right? The contract with Cyber Ninjas uh-huh. leaves them completely ir- un- not responsible for any costs mm-hmm. after the audit is done, incurred after the audit is done, which means voting machines. Well, isn't that the social contract we have with all Republicans, no matter how badly they <laughs> fuck everything up? They're not responsible. They don't have they're to not, pay for yeah, it. Well, the taxpayers of Arizona are going to be responsible. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you want to do local news, but this one tickled me. Well, two years ago, Liz Cheney was actually here in this town and being highlighted by the local GOP for, and I'm not kidding, advances in Republican women in leadership. Oh, Lord. She's so awesome. Look at it. Look, we have a woman who's in the leadership position. Look how awesome our party is. She was literally and physically, uh, literally and figuratively embraced by Rodney Davis, who at the time, I'm not kidding, was blaming Nancy Pelosi for mm-hmm. why there were so few women and minorities in the GOP. Because wow. she funded races against women who were Republicans where their men were running against them. Obviously, she hates women. No, she mm-hmm. hates Republicans, as any right-thinking person would, which all <laughs> the fact that she funded or helped fund dozens and dozens and dozens of women who also ran for office, many of whom won. But Rodney Davis is that kind of dull ass end of the Republican propaganda machine who just like, and Nancy Pelosi hates the ladies because she ran yeah. people against them. But yeah. Liz Cheney was here. And they were kissing her ass because she was right. Like, and and he has st- he has still said the la- when they had an actual voice vote uh-huh. or an actual on the record vote for Liz Cheney a few a couple months ago. Yeah, he voted in favor of her remaining in leadership. Well, he said when it was a voice vote. Yeah, he didn't show up in time. No, to he vote. was well. He was he and uh, he and Darren LaHood were busy practicing tying their shoes, and they forgot there was a meeting, and then the meeting right. ended, and who knows what happened. But at the time, Rodney Davis was talking about how awesome it was. And how he looked forward to being a delegate, uh, casting his vote for President Liz Cheney. And she said she looked forward to him being a leader of the Republican Party. Like, you know, two years, yeah. man. In just two years. That's what a happened. A long time in politi- in Republican politics. Much to our delight and surprise, we discovered that we're on our 599th episode. And that's just amazing. <laughs> it is. We're on yeah. 599. Next week, we will be doing our 600th show. It will yes. be a letter show. Mm-hmm. We've gotten some great letters. I'm sure we'll also have news roundup and some other commentary, but yeah. we've got some good letters to read to you and we're looking forward to that. And uh, thank you for supporting us through 600 episodes. Some of you have been with us for that long. I know. It's amazing. And, and as we tell everyone, please don't play the first 20 episodes. No, don't um, play the first year. <laughs> no, we <laughs> Just, were learning. We were, we really we were learning and, how to and, do this. We're and that still has learning. Been, that has yeah. been so much fun. I mean, you know, looking back, it's like, Technology fails and and the cable doesn't mm-hmm. work and and we had to go find some Wi Fi someplace and the microphones and you all were full of good suggestions and of course yeah, insane and suggestions donating microphones to us yeah. and all kinds of stuff yeah um, um, but it's just we have had such a supportive and kind and thoughtful um, and eloquent uh, listener base mm-hmm. who just every week it, it, we love doing this this is what we talk about but. It's so rewarding to hear back from you, even though I'm a terrible correspondent. And it's so cool that so many of you have been right along there with us at our elbow um, all this time. Um, through through thick and thin, now, literally. There is yeah. another podcast, yeah. and I, I'm not going to say anything disparaging about them because I've already done that. Uh, mm-hmm. But the Bulwark podcast hit its 600th episode this week, I believe. Um, they because they do daily, they right? They do one every day. Yeah. Um, we yeah. are in our 12th year now, really, coming up on our 12th year. Um, yeah. And some of you have been with us through the Obama administration. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's just amazing that, and again, we couldn't be more grateful and uh, we appreciate it. And we're going to k- just keep going. I mean, uh, our 1200th episode is going to be an ass kicker. Um, we're <laughs> 600 gonna, episodes from now, yeah, oh Lord. We're going to take our masks <laughs> off and pants and who knows what. <laughs> but um, thanks yeah. for everything. And now we continue. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Olivia. And Olivia is adorable, and she is snuggled up against her favorite pillow. She has a favorite pillow. Oh. And, uh, of course, Olivia eats freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cats will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured. Freshly poured, 
Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Olivia at our Facebook page or website. You can send your internet kitty, dog, or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. It is not too late to send us an email. Let us know uh, what the political landscape looks like where you live. We'd love to hear from you. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. Hashtag Fire to Joy. I do like that hashtag. Yeah, fire to Joy already. I know they and can't. They have to get a board in place. the post office. Yeah. Yep. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, to, up here it's iced, you know, lattes because it's sure. kind of hot. Because we're fancy that way. Yeah. <laughs> buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And it's a labor of love. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution. You can join the 1%. By donating, uh, we have PayPal, postal address information, Patreon, merch, all of it is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Next week, again, is our 600th episode show, so send in your emails and letters, letters, letters. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, Drift Class, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties want you to know they are not misbehaving. They are practicing for the Summer Olympics gymnastics competition. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whine and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.